Welcome to Zorba Zorb Gaming, my name's Lachlan Linton Keen, and welcome to my finally completed 48 square foot Pelennor Fields gaming board. Well, we have come to the conclusion of a massive six month build and what a journey it has been. And I am absolutely stoked with the finished result. I tried a whole lot of techniques that I hadn't done before and I think they've all come together really well to result in a pretty stellar finished product that is pretty eye catching and, and blows people away. I am super happy with it. Before we dive into the final two elements that brought together the whole board, I just want to do a big shout out to all of our Patreons who support us. Uh, obviously these massive builds are incredible incredibly expensive and a huge undertaking. So to have you guys behind us is absolutely invaluable. Thank you so much for your support. If any of you guys at home want to jump in and uh, get behind us and help us do what we do, make sure you jump down in the description and check out our Patreon. Conversely, if you'd like to score some terrain yourself, whether it's a huge piece or something a little smaller, make sure you check out Zorbazorp.com and check out our commissions page. We're always happy to uh, chat with clients and create some pretty cool terrain for you guys at home. Now, the two final pieces of the the puzzle to finish off this massive board are our two final two by four foot sections. In our first four videos, that's right, this is part five, we covered the center board with our corpses and our flame trenches and our two massive pieces of the Ramus Ecor, the Gondorian wall for the outer ring of the Poleno. And now in this video, we're going to be having a look at some ruined Gondorian homesteads, some farmland and a few different types of crops, a few more corpses, because of course we can never have enough, and of course a couple of really nice resin filled marshy pools just to add a little bit of flavor to the board. Now all of the uh, static grass and tufts and foam flocks that we're going to be using in this video and in all of the other previous videos you can now buy from us. That's right we are officially stocking all of the Luke's APS Scenics range so make sure you head over to Zorbazorb.com to grab all your static grass and your tufts and your foam flocks. It's another great way to support the channel and help us doing what we do and of course you guys get some really really high quality terrain products they're absolutely amazing quality. Luke's have put together a phenomenal range that is easily as good, in my opinion, as Woodland Scenics and Pico and everyone else. In fact, I think they're better personally and at a really great price point. They're fantastic. So make sure you guys check out all of that stuff if you want to be following along with us at home. But now, let's jump right back in time to pass Lockie at the beginning of the build and jump into finishing our final two sections of Gondorian farmland, homesteads and marshes. Let's dive into it. left to do and then this board will finally be finished. First up we're going to have two more sections to build. These are four by two foot sections which go on the outside of the four by four center board that we built in the last two videos. Now because they're on the outside of that center area, we're going to be continuing the themes of the center board into these regions. One thing that was really important to me was to uh, design the terrain in a way so that your eye wasn't drawn to the lines between all of the little modular sections. So the kind of big fa 
focus uh, for me is to make sure that we don't just have corpses and pelon or fields -y kind of churned up area just in that center board or it will seem really disparate and obvious. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue corpses and broken up muddy sections sort of about a third to a half way into these boards and then transition back into this kind of beautiful grassy stuff uh, and that way it won't be kind of you know broken up by those lines and it's going to be quite a nice large area of Pelennor fields and the other thing to think about when we're designing what we're going to do with these boards is that yes this is primarily a big 6x8 board but I've built this in such a way in terms of the different modular sections that we can pull everything apart and recombine it to make three 4x4 four four boards so these two boards that we have left to do will be the matching pairs of our two Ramus Accord boards. So obviously on one side of these boards we're going to have the big beautiful Ramus Accord and then we're going to have whatever we make on this other side and then that will be a single 4x4 board for playing other kind of scenarios and games which should be really cool. So obviously we have to make sure that we consider what's happening on these boards and that's why the second half of the board after it bleeds to corpses will turn back into that kind of more fuller coverage of grass because that way when we butt it up against these boards they're going to match perfectly. So the corpse side will go against the center board in the big board and then the grassy side will perfectly slot against the Ramus Accord when they're in smaller 4x4 formation. So super versatile, super awesome and that's the kind of design elements that I really like to think about when I'm making these big builds because then you get really good bang for your buck with the terrain that you're making. Now uh, what's actually going to be on these boards is kind of uh, I guess something to consider. Obviously we're still in that kind of plainsy environment so we can have little rock elements and lots of graphs and tufts in our corpses but the other kind of big thing that the Polenor was known for, even though we don't see any of it on the movies, is that it is the pasture land and the farms of Gondor. This entire ring wall is here to protect the field of the Polenor because it's an incredibly important area for Gondor. They grow all their farms, they grow all of their cattle and everything in this area. So I wanted to kind of tip the hat to that and bring in a sort of farmy sort of element that is, you know, of course being trashed by the orcs as they've moved in. So we're going to have a, a, a ruined kind of farmhouse and, and some low cobble stone walls and a bit of a, a farming track and, uh, and some crops as well, which is fun because I've never built anything like farmland or crops before, uh, so that should be really exciting. We'll do a similar sort of farmhouse style to our normal Gondorian stone, so that will match quite well, uh, and then we'll have it a bit trashed and ruined because uh, the orcs, they just break everything when they come in the Polenor. They set all these farmhouses ablaze. There's a couple of lines in the books where the Gondorians are sitting on the walls of Minas Tirith, and as the... Uh, hordes of Mordor stream into the Palenor, they see all these little spot fires as all the homesteads get lit on fire. So we're definitely going to tip our hat to that kind of gorgeous sort of image looking over from the battlements. The other thing to consider uh, is of course we've got this road here which works perfectly for our big board but once we pair it up with our 2x4 section we're going to have to continue it. We're going to have to have some more road uh, otherwise it's just going to kind of end and match up against grass which will look really gross and that of course means we have to think about how that's going to fit on the full uh, kind of 6x8 board. So if we just take this and line it up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a, a little bit of road and then that's going to lead into our farmhouse and end so that that will at least kind of look aesthetically pleasing for this uh, 4x4 configuration. And then what we'll do is we'll make sure that this is the grassy side. Obviously it's got to match anyway. And then we have our corpses over here and that way when uh, we're combining it in the kind of big 6x8 uh, configuration we can just have uh, this section here where the road goes off from the farmhouse just come off to one of the very edges uh, which I can chuck a, uh, a finished version of what that looks like now so you guys can see that it works perfectly in both configurations. So uh, the first thing to do is to kind of sit back and do a bit of a plan, work out where exactly the farmhouse is going to go, um, how that's going to be built. Uh, obviously I'm going to be using Hearst Arts Bricks once again just like this to knock that up so I'll start mocking up the design and then we'll come back and we'll see how the first 2x4 board is going to look in terms of layout. So I've just knocked up our first little farm dwelling here. I've decided to go for a, sort of like a half roof stable that opens out onto this kind of little animal pen that would have had livestock or horses. And then we'll be able to kind of put a bit of a slanted roof on that that's all smashed and broken in on one side and fill it with sort of hay and kind of livestock paraphernalia, which should be quite cool. And I've mapped out that our road is only going to come to about here. And then we're going to have it sort of break up as if the stone's kind of old and worn and then form more of like a, a farm track with wheel ruts and dirt and mud. The 
will wrap around this way and perhaps even continue down here a little bit where we'll have a little bit more fields and kind of feel the action and then of course all our corpses will start to be coming in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move this all and rip it out of the way and first put the row down so that I can use my roller to roll all the way up and not hamstring myself by getting the bricks in the way. The little cobblestone walls that you see here that I'm using for the farm enclosure are just a resin mold that I've had for Ooh, I want to say probably 15 years um, and never really kind of put them to use in any meaningful way So I thought I'd just knock those up and they'd add a little something You could just as easily use like a resin molded uh, stone wall from one of the Hearst Arts molds Or even just carve them yourself out of extruded polystyrene like we did in the Edoras video I'll link that down below so you can have a look And uh, this set even comes with a little uh, metal gate which is really quite cool I've got that painted up as a, a nice little timber looking thing So that will go down well and they, uh, they even came with sort of you know half of them kind of this big bow that was like a hole in the wall so I just snapped that one in half and put it on either end and we'll put a bit of rubble and stuff where the broken wall would have been. So that's looking pretty nice. I'll rip that all out of there and first I'll jump into the road and then we can get this all glued down, put the broken roof on and, uh, and start to kind of move into the rest of our farmland before we texture up the whole board. So that's our little farmhouse all glued together and I've also smashed in a whole bunch of rubble using the same techniques we use for the Ramus wall, uh, getting lots of different grain sizes in there and then finishing that all with tile grout, heating the whole thing with isopropyl alcohol and then a big spray of water down PVA to lock that in. I've also finished off just a few little sections of broken roof using balsa wood backed with our cardboard tiles and had some of those fall into the rubble as well. Uh, just so that you get, when it's all painted, that nice pop of blue from the tiles as well as a few pops of brown from the broken timber section from uh, roofing that has flipped over as it's fallen and that'll look quite nice when it's all tied in with the grey scheme of the stone. So that's a little farmhouse section kind of finished for now and then we've got our road here which you can see has come in. I've got lots of rubble going onto it to help kind of integrate it into the house itself and then it sort of just tapers off and falls apart as it comes in and I just did that by really stretching the wood putty as I was rolling it and letting it break and tear as I got right to the end and I think that's going to look absolutely awesome once all those little bits are picked out and stone Cut. So now we're on to doing our actual farms. Now this isn't something I've done before, so I'm going to use a kind of tried and true technique from the historical wargaming community, and that's to use things like door mats to be the basis of your crops. So uh, I've got a couple of mats here that I just grabbed from Bunnings, really cheap. This one was five bucks, this one was like two. Uh, you want to kind of just get cheap, shitty stuff because we're going to be doing so much to it anyway. Uh, this one is kind of more of like an indoor mat that's got these really nice grooves that could be representing like tilled earth and crops that are growing, you know, you've got the channel that the Gondorian farmers would have dug out and then the dirt mounds and then what we'll do is we'll cut out all of these little squares because I don't really like the cross hatch pattern it doesn't feel believable for a farm and uh, and then we'll kind of arrange these in in a nice order and eventually we'll kind of glue them all in and, and, and get like bits of kind of green plant life coming up uh, in the channels as if seedlings are beginning to sprout and, and crops that are quite young uh, and we'll kind of feed those around and then for a bit of contrast I've got this other mat here which much more represents uh, a kind of taller plant life like a corn or a sugar cane and we're going to cut little squares of that and maybe we'll paint it and give it a bit of a dry brush because obviously it's very uniform at the moment and we need a bit of that natural variation for it to look like real plant life so I'll probably hit that with a nice big prime and then give it a sort of two-tone with some greens or yellows to kind of give it a bit more of a planty vibe and once again we'll have a few squares of that in our farm landscape uh, and amongst all of that we'll have kind of dirt tracks and some you know wagon wheel ruts digging into the path and and kind of work all of that out. So the next thing for me to do is just to cut up a bunch of those squares and start to play with the layout of our farms and then we'll work out you know what are the elements we need to bring in where our kind of plant life and, and croppage is going to go on those mats and we'll go from there. The cat 
So that's our crops cut out and glued down into a pretty cool little layout. We've got two sections of this tilled earth style, this square here, and then a longer section. And this creates a, I guess, a nice sort of shape for what's going to be our, our farmer's road for sort of full of mud and potholes and wheel ruts. So that will work quite well. Might have it continuing down here as well before it transitions off into grass. And then we've got just the one square of our generic kind of uh, corn wheat style crop, uh, which because it's a bit more of an obstructing piece of terrain, it creates a nice bottleneck uh, between this kind of ruined building and the crop itself for our main road, which would be quite cool from a gameplay perspective because, you know, units will have a tougher time getting through here and we can have some sort of cool defensive lines with Aragorn and the Army of the Dead rushing on this side of the board, but also when it's being played as a full 4x4 adds a bit of interest to that sort of the board because we've got, you know, some pretty serious bottlenecks on this side as well with the gate and the broken uh, the broken Ramus wall. So, obviously these are just pieces of tiling uh, or pieces of floor mat that have gone straight down, uh, so they're not particularly blended, but what we're going to do is blend them all in with filler and all of that when we get to the blending stage of the actual board. So I'll just leave them for now, and up next we're going to start treating the whole surface of the board and moving into corpses. So first up, it is our heat gun, and we're just going to uh, melt away all of the foam that we need to create that nice undulating feel, just like we did with all of the other pieces of the board, uh, making sure that we're matching the level of undulation uh, with this board here, because this is what it will be lining up against, and also making sure we keep it nice and flat on the right hand side, because of course that's matching up with our 4x4 with all the corpses. Now I've got a whole lot more corpses, just like we did in the first 4x4 section, lots of dead Rohan and Orcs from the Mumuk base, as well as all our kind of Gothmog base pieces, there's the uh, Fell Beast bases, there's dead Easterling shields, all that kind of battle paraphernalia, and that's just going to go on this side, uh, where it joins the 4x4 section of the Pelennor fields. When we're gluing them down, we'll take extra care just like we did in the last section to make sure that there's nothing too similar, uh, that the horses are different orientations, make sure it, it looks like lots and lots of different types of models even though we've only got a limited selection of corpses. And to kind of make sure that it looks good, we'll also line this section up next to the 4x4 section as we do that because it's not just the corpses needing to look good within this board, they also need to not be right next to any of their friends when they're lined up, you know, in the big 8x6 configuration. So that will be something to focus on and then once that's glued down, we'll come in with our multi-purpose filler and we'll blend all the edges of the corpses to make sure that they look seamless with the board, we don't have any big lips between our resin moulds and the foam itself, and while we're doing that, we'll also do the same thing with our farm pieces and all of these crops will edge out and, and kind of give them a really nice taper so that they feel like they're part of the board as well. And then after that, we'll just uh, be on to texturing the surface with a bit of texture paint on this side and then our tile grout approach that we use to, to create all our beautiful muddy work and then we'll be on to undercoating and painting and all of the busy business that will be finishing this gorgeous board. So up next is corpses and then our multi-purpose filler and then we can look forward from there. So as you can see, the boards are coming along nicely. Everything's looking nice and contoured. I did all of my heat gunning as well as my wood putty filler to kind of level out everything and blend everything in, including the farms and also the corpses which have now gone down. And now we have moved into grouting. Now everything I've done so far has been exactly the same as in the last video. I've come through, put down 100% PVA and then dropped all of my grout through a sifter to cover everything, getting the PVA in with a nice small brush right up in close against the moulds over that putty and and kind of allowing the, uh, the grout to build up to really blend them in with the board. But what I'm going to do now is slightly vary the technique uh, than what I did last time because we did have the board breaking up a little bit. So uh, what I'm going to do next is vac it all off and pull all of the grout off the corpses themselves uh, and get all of that loose stuff up and then now before I, you know, start 
priming anything or anything. I'm going to hit uh, all of the corpses and all of the grout with isopropyl alcohol and then with watered down PVA and then I'm going to come back and clean up all of the corpses so that no watered down PVA gets left on those because uh, we don't want an extra glue layer between our base coat uh, and then our airbrush paints which are going to go down. That wouldn't look good at all. Um, it'll obscure detail and also the paint might kind of not really adhere to the model that well. So I'll use my isopropyl alcohol and my spray, my watered down PVA uh, to kind of really soak the grout and really lock it in now, really cook it off now before we prime it rather than having to try and fix it after we primed it last time uh, and I'll just try and avoid the corpses as much as possible and that's why the vacuuming is key because you can get all of the grout off them uh, that's loose uh, because any grout that gets hit by this isopropyl alcohol and PVA is going to cook off and is going to go hard and if it's on our corpses that will be bad. So into vacuuming, then alcohol, then watered down PVA and then cleaning up the corpses and then we should be pretty close to being ready to prime these boards. So my whole grout layer has gone down and it's looking absolutely awesome but what I want to do now is just do a big kind of grout focus pass on our kind of tilled earth style crops uh, just to kind of make them look a bit more natural because they are our doormat they're very quite clearly machined and uniform we want to bring a bit more natural variation in so I, I've done this one here and as you can see it's looking absolutely awesome basically all I've done is grabbed a relatively fine brush and got some really thick kind of layers of PVA and just pulled that all across the crop Brown of the uh, of the tilled earth. Uh, and left it out of the trenches and also used a whole lot of glue uh, to kind of blend all of our joins between our different mats uh, even in the in the trenches for that section just so that there's no kind of gaps uh, and then I've come and uh, put just a big sprinkling of grout all over it also mounting glue all up the edges just once more to give it one more final blend with the board which I think has really helped and then of course with our normal technique come in with isopropyl alcohol and uh, and then spray glue and sprayed it down so what that's effectively effectively done is because I've mounded the glue up just on the ridges a lot more grout has gone there and cooked off in some really kind of interesting natural looking shapes uh, but still the grout that has fallen in the trenches from just being sifted gets locked down by the spray glue so you still get rid of a lot of the kind of gross texture of the doormat uh, keeping the good parts but getting rid of the bad but we still get a higher concentration of grout on the ridges and you don't just have to stick to the ridges too occasionally you can let glue fall into the trenches and then uh, that looks quite nice as well. So, let's jump into that. Alright, so taking nice big thick blobs of glue, we just want to mound on those ridges, especially around these joints, get it really thick so the glue sits right in and essentially just, you know, makes it one long continuous ridge. And on the edges, mounding it all the way up so it looks like one nice kind of big curved ridge all the way around especially at these ends too, because obviously the trough just ends. We'll fill in that with a, a bit of glue and, and make that look mounded too. So all the grout went down on our crops really well. We've got just a nice, really crop-like texture that is a lot more blended into the board and I've gone and smashed down all of our priming coats. Now this time I've done it a little bit differently because we've only got uh, kind of select areas that are gonna have our pellet or mud with our uh, wooden deck tan and our red brown. Uh, I've used all of uh, the Design Master range to cover just the other kind of broader areas that are going to be 100% static grass because these guys are a lot more expensive, aren't they Dan? Also oh, yeah. Dan's here. Uh, and, uh, and you know, we get a lot better coverage that costs us a lot less on these big broad areas. Uh, so yeah, focus focus your areas with your expensive paints and you'll go a lot further. And of course, our grey rust oleum just to hit all of the stonework. Now I haven't yet uh, soaked our uh, corn style crop. Uh, we'll come back and do that later once we've kind of worked out the, the best sort of scheme for that. Uh, we might try a couple of examples where we do a bit of washing or a bit of kind of dusting with different kind of colours and, and see the best kind of look we can get. But for now, it's time to jump into our airbrushing and Dan is here to help us again once more with that. The final leg, Dan. Yes. It's been a, uh, it's been a considerable trip yes, yeah, trying to get all this done. A lot less this time. We yeah. had we had something like over a hundred corpses on the last board and I think we've probably only got 40 or 50 on these two pieces uh, but still a considerable amount to get done. Luckily yeah. no more mumma kills here, they're all finished so no more big time sinks but I still reckon we'll be here all day. 
Um, so what have we got uh, in terms of layers? We're going to start with our greens again? Yep, so pretty much the exact same process that we did with the previous board. Fantastic. So we're going to put down our, you know, the lowest layers first, which was all the green from the the uh, cloaks mm -hmm. and then we're going to go back and we'll do the horses and then you know all the leather stuff like your saddles the leather armor itself and then highlight the armor itself again with a red and then it's going to be picking the details which are here and there scattered all over the place like your shields mm. the easterlings and all the orcs yeah, yeah. Are, and lots of lots of metallics lots of yes. metal everywhere cool all right well let's jump into our first coat man So the board is now fully painted. I just put the last layer of matte varnish down on the corpses and they are looking absolutely fantastic. Once again, a huge thank you to Dan from Full Scale Conflict for coming up and spending another day with us here in the studio to knock those guys off. We just used the exact same techniques as last time for the corpses with all of our airbrush layers and then our semi-gloss layer and, uh, and getting a really nice enamel wash and then pulling that all back and then finishing them off with a matte varnish and they're looking absolutely awesome. I've also touched up all of our ruins and our road getting our nice kind of blue stone really helps that board pop as well as a few of our little wooden details on those broken roof tilings and I've also done uh, our groundwork uh, just with that kind of graduated scheme of different browns and yellows and sandy tones just through the main body of the brown uh, that's going to be mainly coated with static grass just in case we have any kind of breaks of color coming through the grass uh, and also on our crops now these are going to be basically very featured as as a, as a dirt element so I just made sure that they had quite a nice kind of uh Focusing on the, the contrast between the rises of the ridges and the channels, keeping the channels nice and dark, basically almost just the, the uh, Mission Brown or October Brown that we primed them, uh, and then just coming along and using that graduated brown scheme that I painted the first two boards with just across the tops of the ridges, and that'll look really nice once those deeper recesses are filled with the green of crops and those sorts of things. So they're looking really great as well. I also touched up the road a little bit more, uh, just to kind of give it a nice sort of muddy tone. Once again, creating contrast by dry brushing across the tops of the ridges of the road. So, painting is looking awesome. Now it's finally into static grassing. So, once again, exact same techniques as last time. I'm going to chuck down all of my tufts. Uh, and then from there, going to our thicker grasses, uh, beginning with our kind of big, broad coverage grass, which I think this time is going to be a four millimeter summer because we need to match the grasses, not just close to the edge of the center board, which you'll remember got a little bit darker because they're a bit more chewed up, but out towards the edges here, uh, these grasses need to match the grasses from the first two sections of the ramus. So uh, yeah, nice big, broad coverage stuff. We'll get our first layer down with just a big, thick layer of PVA, and then I'll layer in all of those extra colors we've got that wild meadow to provide that kind of yellow warmth and then that nice sort of uh, kind of brown winter grass which is quite a nice dark grass to kind of break up our big patches of green and then as we get into our really churned up muddy section which is looking absolutely beautiful now it's got the corpses all finished we use those shorter, darker grasses, and basically as I do those edges, I'm actually going to line these boards up with the center board so that I can make sure that the grass patterns that I'm putting on are going to match any grass that goes to the edge so that we're not going to have a hard line of grass finishing on one board and not continuing on the other board because that would look absolutely stupid. So, lots to think about, lots of grassing to do, and then this board is basically done, and then we have our kind of full finishing stage of the entire 6x8 board. So we are very close to lining up all one, two, three, four, five pieces of the full board and seeing them all together and grass and that is going to be a special moment. So let's jump into tufts and let's jump into static grass.
So that's all the static grass down and it's looking really awesome. I'm super happy with how the crops have come out. Now they're kind of edged in grass. They're really nice and blended. Haven't done the crops themselves yet. That's still to come. And this farmer's track is just looking absolutely awesome with the kind of ridges of static grass down the center. It helps to really define the shape of that track and really highlights the kind of wagon wheel ruts and mud and all the kind of wonderful detail that's going on in that track. But you will notice that over here we've got a pretty big bear patch and a few other small ones. And that's essentially because I ran out of static grass like I always do because I never buy enough and I was trying to think of some ways that I could save some grass but also add a little bit more interest to this side of the board because it's pretty much just a big flat section which was the original intent because I did want somewhere on these kind of uh, sections of boards to be able to be flat that we could put down other pieces of terrain so that when you're reusing it in either the 4x4 section or even on the Paleno if you want to ha add an extra Gondor homestead or a hill or a forest there's some flat areas that's not covered with corpses and castle uh, that you can put that down. So I wanted to make sure that I still kept it flat but added a bit more interest and saved on grass. So I decided to leave these sections bare and then create a bit of a boggy marshland uh, which I think is going to be really cool because it's still flat but it does have a bit of gameplay interest creating some shallow water and, uh, and I think it's going to also visually really add to the board having a few pockets of kind of this marshy bog land. So I kind of had a look around the workshop uh, as the, the best way to create that and I found that I still had a whole bunch of epoxy resin, uh, which is a really nice clear translucent resin left over from my Osgiliath build, so we can get to really create some cool kind of water effects in these marshes. Uh, and uh, I, I thought that it's, it's marshland, right? So it is still grass and it's still kind of gross tussocks. It's not like a riverbed. So I didn't want to put down any rocks and make it look like this perfect little water feature. We want it to look like a real kind of bog. So I'm going to come back in with some static grass tufts and put them all through these sections and they're going to become submerged when we pour the resin on. They're more just sort of poking out the top, which will add some really nice detail because the great thing about translucent resin is that you can see through it. And I'm going to leave it relatively clear and not color it and let the detail of what's underneath and in the resin really Really shine through and I think that's going to look epic for kind of this boggy marshland. Uh, the other thing of course is that the sections that I've left are the lower sections, the recesses, because of course that's where water would catch in the lower culverts, but they're also the sections that I melted with the heat gun. So you'll notice they've got a really interesting texture which kind of looks a bit too sort of spacey and futuristic if you were just going to leave it on the top. It doesn't really look like a, a normal kind of muddy landscape, but on the bottom of a riverbed or a, or a marsh or a water feature, I think it's going to look really nice to be kind of weirdly churned up mud and kind of just that gross muddy boggy shape underneath the resin combined with a bunch of static grass over the bits that look a bit too crazy and I think it's going to sell really well. So what I'm going to do now is jump into just slapping down all those static grass tufts and then we'll come back and I'll break out the resin kit and we'll go through the whole kind of resin process and, and take, sort of take you guys through how that all works and mixing up the resin and pouring it and making sure it looks really awesome and even because resin looks absolutely bad and it adds so much to the board and it's uh, yeah, it's a really fun thing to go through. So let's jump into the static grass tufts and then it's into resin land. So all my tufts are down and I've exclusively used the brown kind of dark patchy 10 millimeter tuft and I haven't used this one at all on this part of the field so it creates a really nice contrast to the kind of help emphasize the way that the different grasses would grow when they're submerged in water. They'd be a lot darker, a lot murkier, and it also adds to kind of the whole kind of marshy, gross look. Uh, I've also spent a fair bit of time ripping the tufts up to get some really nice small tufts and different sizes, so it looks really sporadic and natural. Otherwise, I'd have, you know, 10 tufts that are all the exact same size, like they come out of the packet, and we want it to look really nice and organic. So I've done that uh, in my big area and my four little areas as well, so now it's time to mix our resin. Now, the resin that we're going to be using is uh, an epoxy resin. There are many different resins out there. The two major kind of classes of them are epoxies and polyesters. We always want to be working with epoxy resins because they're really friendly for what we're using them for. They're really foam safe. If you use polyester resins, polyester is actually a solvent for polystyrene. So if we're making any terrain out of, you know, hills or 
or this whole board for instance is uh, extruded polystyrene, if I poured some polyester resin on here and it managed to find its way through many of the little porous surfaces into the polystyrene, it will just dissolve the whole board, which has happened to me in the past. So, make sure you do your homework and pick the right resin for the right job. Today we're using an epoxy resin because it's wonderful and foam safe. So the resin that I'm using is just called epoxy cast. I just get it from my local kind of resin and plaster and supply store, big hobby shop called Barnes here in Brisbane. It's a two-part epoxy, so that means it comes with part A and part B. Both of those are uh, chemical components that are totally inert and chill on the, by themselves, and then when we mix them together, we get a really great chemical reaction, which hardens into a beautiful, translucent, pretty clear-looking resin. So we grab our part A and our part B in the right ratio, we mix it all together, and we've got a 45-minute working time. So that's plenty of time to get it all mixed nice and evenly without creating too many bubbles, and then we pour it in, lots of time to get it down into the board and be a bit finicky and play with it while it's still a liquid, make sure it moves around the grasses, in the right way and then after that 45 minute working time it has a three and a half hour demold time or cure time which means it'll go hard as if it was ready to take out of a mold obviously we're going straight into a board uh, in about three and a half hours so it's great because it's long long enough working time that you're not you know completely going crazy like the 10 minute resin we used for the uh, Pelinor Fields molds uh, and uh, and it also doesn't take 25 fucking hours to dry uh, which is also really important because some resins are like 24 48 hours and I can't be bothered waiting two days to keep moving on with the rest of the board. Alright, so let's have a look at what we need to mix up our resin. Obviously the first and most important thing is our PPE, our personal protective equipment. You want a really good gas mask with vapor grade filters. Uh, this stuff isn't nice to breathe in, you don't want to be breathing too much of it. I'll be a little bit lazy because I've got to talk, but you know. Uh, that's just me, you guys should be safe at home. Uh, rubber gloves, a good pair, nice and thick. You don't want to get this shit on your skin. It washes off, but it, you know, uh, particularly, basically contact with either of those before they're mixed is pretty gross and it's not super good for you, so avoid that. Uh, and of course, some eye protection. We don't want this shit in our eyes. In general, you should be working in a well-ventilated space and have access to water in case you need to rinse your eyes out or wash your hands or get the crap off really quickly. So make sure you've got all the right protocols in place. Then we're just gonna grab some little kind of party cups uh, these are just for mixing our different components so that we can pour A into one, pour B into the other, and then have a third one for mixing. Nice and simple. And then I've just got some paddle pop sticks or coffee stirrers just to help us mix it through. Now, the real trick here is going to be mixing up the right volume because I don't want to mix too much. Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, I'm going to have heaps of resin to spare. But because we've got the 45 minute working time, we can probably, you know, mix a little bit, pour it in, see if we need more, keep going, etc., etc. So it's not too worrying. So we're going to jump into it. First up, let's uh, gown ourselves up, get my gloves on. Don't I look amazing? Well, let's see if I can open these, alright? Success. Hey, that was much easier than I thought it was. Okay. Alright, so we're kitted out. Now we grab our cup, chuck it on the scales and tear it off so that it goes back to zero. That way we're not accounting for the weight of the cup. And then I'm going to grab my part A and start measuring that out. Now, uh, I think I'm going to start with 100 grams of part A to 50 grams of part B. I will see how much that is and pour that in and keep going if we need to. So let's just grab our stuff. And of course, we're all wearing our masks, aren't we? Good. That's what we like to hear. And in we go. 20, 40, 60, 80, 83, 92, 96, 98, come on. All right, 100 and two. All right, so that's my part A. I'll just throw that back on so we don't have any unnecessary vapors. Once again, chuck my cup on, tear it off, and I'll grab my part B. And this time I want 51 grams, because half as much as we had of part A. That's 45, 51. Fantastic, so we've got our part A and our part B. Uh, make sure that you remember which cup is which. I should write it down, but I'll just keep it right-handed, left hand, because you don't want to be swapping the cups around as you make different batches, otherwise you'll start cooking off the little bits of leftover resin in the cups, and you want that to only happen in your mixing cup. So now we just mix these in. Don't pour them in too fast. Just nice and steady. Basically, at every opportunity, we want to be minimizing the amount of bubbles that we're putting in because bubbles are pain. It is a relatively uh, mid-length cure resin, so you know a lot of the bubbles will move out of it, uh, but it's not as forgiving as, say, something like a plaster, uh, which can be really great for getting rid of bubbles. 
Okay, so now we just nice and gently mix our two parts together with our coffee stirrer. You don't need to beat the crap out of it. We don't want to put excess bubbles in by really kind of over mixing furiously. Just nice and even to get those two parts mixed together. And remember, we've got plenty of time to do this, so you don't have to be in a panic or a rush. That's why it's a really nice forgiving resin to work with, particularly if it's your first time playing with resin. Alright, so I've got a little bit of bubble in there, and honestly, a little bit of bubble's not so bad, right? Because, you know, it's a big sort of marshland, it'll kind of just look like ripples in the water or whatever. So it's not, not the end of the world, as long as you haven't got any big, kind of really gross, obvious ones. Alright, that is pretty well mixed. So now the terrifying moment, where we start to put some resin in. The key to pouring your resin is that we just want to have control and not panic because we don't want to spill resin anywhere else. Technically, that sort of there are techniques uh, doing things like long pours, which is where you pour from really high to get a really long stream of the material, whether it's resin or a plaster or whatever, and that helps to get rid of bubbles because as the material is drawn out in the long pour, the bubbles are pulled out. Uh, but I'm not going to do that because uh, it's a greater risk for me to just freak out and knock it all over my static grass. So I'm going to be relatively close, just enough control, and I'm going to pick a place to pour and pour there and let it flow out. I don't want to pour right on top of my tufts because I'm not sure if I'm going to have them fully covered because I don't actually know how high I want the water to come. I'm going to play it by ear. But first, I'm going to start with a little guy so that I don't, uh, you know, ruin this big one, which is kind of important. So let's start with this guy and I'm just going to pour, we'll say here, nice and slowly. Alright, there's a little bit. Let's, let's let that diffuse and see how it looks. Now one thing that we could be fighting here is the meniscus of the resin. We want to make sure that it doesn't sort of, you know, make any weird shapes kind of bulbing up. But because uh, it's edging into static grass, which is a lot of little sharp fibres, that will actually really help us by breaking up the meniscus, uh, which you can already see it's doing, which is really exciting. The resin sort of seeping up into the grass on the outside and staying in the center. That looks absolutely fucking awesome. That's awesome. All right, so let's add a little bit more because I think we can have a, a higher water level in this guy. Now, it looks like I might have to coax it to come over to this side a little bit more. So we'll just put A little bit of stuff here. I want to make sure I don't land on this tuft. Now this is where our coffee stirrers can be useful. So I'm going to come in and I'm just going to say to the resin, hey buddy, why don't you go and explore up in this little area? Oh, that looks fantastic. That looks fantastic. The other thing, of course, is you need to make sure you're on a level surface or your resin's not going to be level. That is hugely important. Okay, let's leave that guy for now. He's looking great. Need to obviously be careful when you're moving the board around because you do have liquid in there now, right? Now, let's go into the big guy. Let's do it. I'm just going to pour it in this little center area because I know it's really deep here. Now, I'm expecting that these tufts are going to get fully covered. They're going to be completely underwater. Ooh, that was a big chunk of, of something. Perhaps a little uh, catalyzed piece of resin. We'll go and check that out in just a sec with the paddle pop stick. Alright, let's just dump everything that we've got in there. Let's see what it's going to do. So I'm feeling like this table might be swaying to the left a little bit because I'm noticing that these, the, the liquid's going a lot over there, but really it should be flat and coming up into this area. So what I'm actually going to do is because I to, to help the resin go where I want it to, I'm just going to chop the other side of the table. Alright, so exciting stuff. We're getting some really nice seepage of all the moisture working its way up into the grass along the edge, which just looks absolutely badass. And we've also got, uh, now that I've leveled that out kind of more appropriately, the resin starting to move over into this section. So what I'll do now is I'll chuck my mask on and finish all of this and keep pouring. And, uh, and we'll come back and have a look when we've got all of the resin in.
So with the resin completed, that leaves us with one tiny little detail to finish off before all of the boards of the Pelennor fields are finished, and that is of course our crops. Now we're not going to do anything too crazy, but just add a little bit of extra detail to really bring them to life. Now I've got two different sets of crops, this kind of longer, uh, kind of more narrow crop field, and then I've got this lovely square one here, so I'm going to use a couple of different techniques as if we're growing different crops, and also uh, showcase to you guys all the different types of things that we can do. So, for our big square one, we're going to use a combination of different tufts to kind of hint at different plant life. So, I've just got some uh, kind of nice, uh, I guess they're kind of a, a burgundy, almost a, a reddy purple sort of different flower tuft, uh, which I'm going to use uh, all the way along each row. And then I've also got uh, some summer tufts, which are from the Lux APS Scenics range, which you can buy from Zorbazorb.com down in the description. And these are just a really love, rich, rich, vibrant green tuft, uh, and I'm going to pull those apart part into different sizes and intersperse those on alternating rows between the flowers and that should give us uh, a nice little kind of uh, bush or shrubby sort of uh, crop like a tomato or, or something like that which will look really nice in that whole field and then over here on the long field we're going to do a bit more of an underdeveloped crop something that's still a seedling uh, and to do that I'm just going to use uh, some of our Luke's APS foam flock now this comes in three different colors a bright green a mid green and a dark green uh, it's a fantastic flock for doing kind of general coverage, obviously. It's, it's sort of like an alternative to static grass for getting really nice ground coverage. But in small amounts, you can kind of use it to do a little bit of foliage detail. Now the great stuff, uh, the great thing about this stuff is that it's actually a two-in-one flock. It's a fine flock and a coarse flock. Uh, if you want it really fine coverage, you just apply it through a sieve. Otherwise, it's still quite clumpy, which gives you a great level of control to create sort of different sized uh, crop features. So what we're going to do is use that stuff to apply through our little crops as if little green seedlings are just popping up. So lovely, easy stuff uh, that's gonna give these crops a little bit of detail. So the first thing I'm gonna do is grab my PVA and grab a whole bunch of that. Dump that into my PVA palette, which is now almost an inch thick with dried PVA layers, and, uh, and take my brush and apply it to the top of the ridges. Now for this particular square one, we're gonna be using our tuft, so you can also just apply the tuft directly to uh, the glue itself and then drop it on. Uh, you always want to put a little bit of PVA down just like our grass tufts because even though these are self-adhesive sort of tufts, uh, you know, they, they never really uh, stick on their own. They definitely need a bit of glue to bond. I'll just grab another one of those. Now make sure you space them sort of evenly apart. You know, they're little shrubs that are coming up. They shouldn't be going absolutely crazy. So as you can see, I'll put in a, a bit of a detail shot so you guys can have a little look. Those are looking quite nice. And then conversely, on our other alternating side, we grab our Luke's APS Summer Tuft. So you guys can see there, it's a really nice vibrant green. And the trick with these is to do lots of different sizes. So these tufts are fantastic. They're on an adhesive base, so you can just rip them apart and resize them. Uh, and I think that can be something that's a little alarming is when you look at them out of the packet, they all look very similar, but they're so easy. There might be a hundred tufts in there, but I almost never apply them in that kind of normal tuft size. I always rip them up and turn them into lots of different little shapes. And that helps hint at that kind of real natural variation of the tuftage as well. Uh, the, I guess the other key thing is that you should apply these tufts to the ridge, uh, not in the channel. Uh, because obviously when you're gardening, all the horticulturists out there will agree with me, uh, you apply the seed to the top of that uh, of that kind of channel, the top of that row, uh, so that uh, the root system gets as much surface area exposed to sun and to water uh, to kind of help the seed germinate. Uh, so when we're applying our tufts, I'm going to do those on the ridges. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to smash through these and get all of these applied so we can have a look, and then we'll jump into doing our foam flock crop. Foam flock crop. That sounds great. So that's our square patch of crops finished, and that's looking absolutely fantastic. Now it's on to doing our foam flock crop. So what we do is we just grab some more PVA and a nice kind of pointed brush, and we just go along the top of the ridge and, uh, and create a nice deposit of PVA that's in quite a tight line. 
uh, and uh, and leave a fair bit of PVA as well because we we do want to give something for the the foam flock to soak up because that's the way that these foam flocks work is they're really fantastic at soaking up glues and liquids and uh, and that is really helpful for their layering but also for here using them as a crop it really helps them bond to the surface so there's a little bit there and then I'm just going to grab uh, some bright greens I want to get a nice contrast against this kind of dark brown cropland and I just grab a bit of a pinch. Uh, I'm not putting it through the sieve because I want to use it nice and thick and then I'm just going to dab it all the way over. Obviously that's going everywhere but we're going to come back and vacuum that up in a second and I'm just getting all of my nice big clumps and pushing them down hard into that foam. All right, very nice. Now we just come in with our vacuum and we just carefully vac away all of the stuff that we don't want. There we go, and we're left with a lovely little ridge of crop. So I'll smash through and do that to the whole crop field, and then we can have a look at the finished crops and soon the finished board. With the resin marshes and the crops down, that is the final piece of the puzzle and we now have a finished 8 by 6 foot Palinor Fields gaming board. If you guys are still watching at this point, thank you so much for sitting through hours of me chipping away at this massive board. This was obviously a pretty huge undertaking which just started as a tiny little idea inspired by that uh, scenario that came out in the Lord of the Rings army book and it just got bigger than Ben Hur. I mean, this thing is ridiculous. I am really happy with the fact that it's, it's actually pretty usable We've had a lot of tournaments and I've been using the 4x4 configurations of the board all the time and people love playing on them. So even though it's this ridiculously obscenely large board, these boards actually get a lot of play. We've actually played the massive scenario a couple of times now and of course that is going to be coming out in a battle report. But huge boards like this are a massive undertaking for us. So if you guys are keen to see more kind of builds of this scope, let us know down in the comments. It really helps us to know if you guys are keen or conversely if you want to see some smaller, more kind of detailed terrain tutorials, let me know of that as well. And if you enjoyed it, make sure you like the video. It really does help us get up in that recommended so more people can see our crazy stuff and definitely subscribe if you haven't already. Come on, I think I've earned it. Five billion hours on this massive board. Uh, make sure you check out all the Lord of the Rings content we have on the channel if you haven't already. And, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching hours and hours and hours of me making this stupid thing. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the video. I certainly enjoyed putting it together for you guys. Uh, and in the meantime, keep on SBG Gaming. Cheers, guys. <laughs>